Yeah, I was at that volleyball game too. That was great. It was just great to see so many people out there and cheering so loudly, and I know it helped our boys quite a bit. So thanks for doing that. This morning, we are delighted to participate in the McMillan Character Education Speaker Series, which was established five years ago by the Betty and John Hencher family to promote and celebrate the value and importance of character education and character development in sports and, in fact, in life. And we have a very special speaker this morning that I know you're going to enjoy equally as much as the, the uh, members of the community who were able to come to the program last night. Uh, this, is, this is Hall of Fame basketball coach Bob Hurley that we're going to hear from in just a, in just a minute. But before we get to the part of the program, I, I want to thank uh, the Hencher family for their generous support of this special speaker series. We want to thank Betty and John Hencher, uh, and Betty is here, and we're going to ask her to stand in just a minute. Their children, Trent and his wife, Harlan, and Garrett, their son Garrett, and his wife, Keely. Trent, a 1999 graduate of Kincaid, was a three-sport star athlete here and earned a football scholarship to SMU, playing all four years. Garrett attended ninth grade here at Kincaid before moving with his family to Tulsa and completing high school in Holland Hall. Because of their great interest in athletics and character development, this speaker series, this speaker series has a very special meaning to them. And I want to ask Betty if she would stand this morning so we can thank her and her family for making this series possible. Betty, would you stand please? When the Hinchers came to us several years ago about creating and sponsoring this speaker series, they wanted to name it in honor of someone who left a definite mark on their family, their entire family. And so the speaker series was named in honor of longtime coach Gary McMillan. As many of you know, Coach McMillan is a legend here at school. He began his career at Kincaid in 1974, teaching history and coaching football. By the time he officially retired in 2007, and we're very pleased that he is not completely retired because he continues to coach varsity boys golf, seventh grade football, and middle school wrestling. Uh, but by the time he had retired in 2007, Coach McMillan had coached almost every sport here, including several girls' varsity sports. And to top, of that, uh, and to top all that off, he, ha he has his teams earned 16 SBC titles in football. And as I said, today he continues to coach the varsity boys golf team, which won SBC last year and will again this year, I'm sure. Um, seventh grade football and middle school wrestling. On top of all of his successes, Coach McMillan embodies all the as aspects that the Hinter family envisioned that this speaker series would be about. Integrity, enthusiasm, love of youth, and Kincaid. Coach Mack, would you please stand so that we can thank you for everything you've done for our students and our school. Millen speaker series today, speaker is Coach Bob Hurley. He traveled here today from New Jersey where he has spent the last 40 years coaching the St. Anthony's Friars. Coach Hurley has won 26 state championships and has more than 1,000 wins in total. He is known for his coaching tactics and as someone who demands commitment, self-control, and sacrifice both on and off the court. St. Anthony's has sent over 150 players to the Division I basketball programs, all in full scholarships, and five of the players he's coached has been have been first round NBA draft picks. Coach Hurley's work has garnered national acclaim. He and his St. Anthony's program have been featured on the CBS TV news program 60 Minutes, as well as on ESPN. Coach Hurley is the proud father of Bobby Hurley Jr., former All-American point guard for Duke University and the Sacramento Kings, and now associate head coach at the University of Rhode Island, and Danny Hurley, a point guard at Seton Hall, and currently the head basketball coach at the University of Rhode Island. Would you please join me in giving a warm Kincaid welcome to Coach Bob Hurley. Thank you, Mr. Love. 
Good morning to everyone. I, I walked through school yesterday and saw everybody walking around with khakis and uh, golf shirts, so I took the tie off this morning, and it turns out you're dressed up, I'm dressed down. So we're, we're two ships passing in the night right now. But I'm, I'm excited to come down here and see you all. I have been, uh, I'm amazed at the facilities that you have here. And when I compare it to my school at home, you know, I'm very jealous. But uh, I think what, what you have, which is just as strong as the facilities, as the staff here and the people who are here to support you. So, you know, the, the Hinchu family, both Betty and John, I want to acknowledge this wonderful thing that you're doing is exposing young people to some different views from, uh, you know, veterans uh, to Coach Mack, who compared to me, Coach Mack is a rookie. He only had 33 years in, I guess, Coach? So I got 40 in, so I'm a little ahead of him. So I would be of a sage, and he's making me look bad for the second day in a row. Coach has got a tie on, which I don't think happens so often. So uh, I, uh, I'm really excited to be here. I, uh, you know, I love working with young people. I've been at my high school for 45 years. I've been a varsity coach for 40. I actually started in 1968 while a college student. And one of the lessons that I learned Early on, I was hired by a man named John Ryan, and he said to me, and I was 19, and the players on the team, the seniors were 17, 18, he said, have everybody call you either Coach or Mr. Hurley. And that Mr. Hurley at age 19 was hard. It was hard, because when they would say Mr. Hurley, I'd look around and see who my dad was, because I really didn't envision myself as, as that particular person. But it kept a separation that was very, very important. Now. Uh, my life has been, uh, it's been extremely fulfilling. The last two years, I have had incredible things happen to me. Two years ago, I was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame. My high school team in the last two years has won their thousandth game, making me, uh, you know, the all-time winningest coach in our state. Uh, 60 Minutes made a call to our school, and Steve Croft from 60 Minutes called, and he wanted to talk to me. So when I called 60 Minutes, not sure that it wasn't a friend of mine pranking me, it in fact was 60 Minutes who followed us going on to beating the number one team in the country at Rutgers University for 9,000 people and then watching it on television a couple of weeks later. Uh, extremely cool. Uh, one other thing I think in this audience, that particular team, by the way, won a national championship. But I guess the thing that I get the most street cred from this past year, I was on the cake boss. <laughs> okay, so I think in a lot of areas, some of those other things are lost on people. But boy, my man, Buddy Velastro, he came to my gym and all of a sudden, locally, I was getting a little bit more juice. So that's how strange things are. But it, it makes me think of some things that Jim Valvano said. And I want you to do this because time goes by so fast. You know, we're in the present right now. As you're moving up the ladder and you're getting ready for, you know, college decisions, things that are happening in the future here, remember where you are, remember where you came from, and, rem and you always keep sight of where you'd like to get to. You know, be in the present, don't forget the past, and always look towards the future. When I do that at this age, I think about being 19 and people calling me, Mr. Hurley, and then I look now to where I am at this point, and my team is on a 65-game winning streak. And we're so excited because we've gone back-to-back -back seasons back in New Jersey, where we go to New York City, we play anyone in that area there, and we've been undefeated back-to-back -back seasons. So as we approach this season, we're aware of a winning streak, we're aware that this little school in Jersey City is 250 students, we don't have a gymnasium, and we just churn out teams that are very competitive because we work at it. And as you're going through life, you're gonna wind up having so many best friends in your life are gonna be people that you've been on teams with, you've been in clubs with, you've been in class with, and they're gonna be people that you're gonna see the rest of your life. At my advanced age, I still have friends that come to my games, wish that they were still in uniform, I don't want to see them in uniform. They'd like to be in uniform. And uh, 
the things that surround those friendships you develop during high school are special. And uh, you know, you want to make sure that you hold on to those. Uh, I grew up as a sports person, and not everyone in the room is going to be a sports person. But we all should have something that we kind of hold on to, that we like to be good at, and that it gives us a little balance from the school day. I was one of those, I guess it's now, I was a daydreamer as a kid. I guess it's now, this is Turnerford. And uh, when I was a kid, as we approached about 2.30, all I had in my mind was uh, I would peek at the clock and figure out what are we doing that afternoon. And from 2.30 to 3, if somebody asked me a question in school, I was in a pile of trouble because I had kind of checked out already. I was getting ready for going to play football or whatever we were doing at the time. And that became something that was kind of embedded in me. So as I got older and I had to get through college and make a decision about careers, I always wanted to have the option of doing something in coaching. So as I was coaching in college, I was going to be, uh, I was going to teach. I loved history. I had a great history teacher in high school named Mr. Hollander, 1963. He taught me American history. And I, I can remember him taking the chapters and having stories that he would use to take the, the story right off the page. And with that influence, I decided that being a history teacher and basketball coach would be the way to go. However, we can try to plan life. It just doesn't necessarily work out like that. So when I graduated from college and couldn't find a contract, I became a, a substitute teacher in Jersey City. And for any of those movies you watch where the substitute teacher comes in and all hell breaks loose, that's kind of the way it was in this high schools in Jersey City when I was a substitute teacher. Except that I wasn't going for that. All right, I wasn't going for that. I, when I coached, I had everybody's attention. So I had, I had some issues. And I can remember going home and talking talk to my dad. He was a Jersey City police officer about, I'm not so sure that I'm going to be able to do this right now. It didn't look like I was going to get a contract. And he said to me, uh, there's a couple of jobs open in the Hudson County Probation Department. So we talked a little bit about it, and very honestly, not even knowing what a probation officer does, I went in and interviewed for a job and began a job. And for the next 30 years, I supervised men on probation in Jersey City. Not necessarily fitting this desire to teach history, but I had a minor in criminal justice, so I kind of segued into that. And then tried to figure out, was I going to be able to do this during the day and coach? and I managed to, to get it to work out. And over the course of those 30 years, I worked with men who had made uh, bad decisions as younger men. Found very few people in my time of probation that were just bad guys. Most of them were people who made bad decisions. And once you start making those decisions at 12, 13, and 14, it's very difficult to get back on track. Recidivism in probation was about 80% which means four out of five are going to return to the system. So it's very frustrating. So what I was able to do is take the advantage of going to practice every day and working with these young people who I thought had all the potential in the world and that there might be some roadblock that's keeping them from, uh, from uh, reaching the potential. So as I say to them, if you get into a situation in life and the door is open a little bit and if you get on the other side of that door, your life may completely change, great things can happen. We say to them, when you open up that door, don't just open the door up and slide through. Rip that door right off the hinges. Take that door right off the hinges because you have so much energy and you want to function. So I started working with young people and found out that as I was coaching, my experience as a probation officer helped me to become more conscious of the inner city. I grew up in the city, but I grew up in a household. I had two parents, uh, they valued education. When I started working in St. Anthony's, initially I had the same type kids, and over the course of time, it very much became an inner city school, and I very much had to involve myself in a lot of other things. So it, it's kind of the way it started. But backtracking a little bit, I have to tell you a story about going into the Basketball Hall of Fame. Now, my story is that I have been twice nominated, and twice I received a phone call right before a ceremony that they have, where they said to me, you know, we think you have a terrific resume, but uh, you're just not quite there. And there were only two high school coaches before me, so I really didn't know that it was gonna happen. And then the third time, I was holding my grandson, 
I was going to church during Lent and Catholic, and we're heading out the door for lunchtime mass, and we get a phone call from the Hall of Fame. And the phone call is, I've been inducted into the Hall of Fame. So now when I go to church that day, I'm obviously have certain things I have to be thankful for. When I go up to the Hall of Fame, the induction ceremony is going to be the 1960 Olympic team. It's going to be the 1992 Dream Team. Those two teams are widely considered the most talented basketball teams ever assembled. And Carl uh, Malone was a great player in the NBA, and Scottie Pippen, who was the, the complimentary great player to Michael Jordan with the Chicago Bulls, they're both going to be inducted. I bring my whole family up. I have my uh, three children. I have, uh, at the time, six grandchildren there, a ton of my friends. And the first ceremony is you're going to receive a, a blazer. And the blazer's going to have the Hall of Fame logo. And we line up on a red carpet, and we're walking down through the Hall of Fame on the red carpet. My whole family's to the right. I'm lined up, and right in front of me is Cynthia Cooper, one of the great women's players of all time. She's going up first. Behind me is Carl Malone, and then Scottie Pippen. Okay, in alphabetical order. So now Cynthia's picture goes up. There's a man with the headset. He waves her down, walks down. I hear Scotty Pippen and Carl kind of like, you know, kind of laughing in the background and saying to himself, boy, they're very relaxed here. I'm a nervous wreck about this. I'm looking at my grandkids. They're not necessarily wrecking the place yet, but we, we need to get the ceremony moving. <laughs> and, uh, and my picture goes up on the wall and they start the introduction. I'm watching the guy, he's got his hand up. And when he finally drops his hand, I freeze. I can't move. I literally can't move. Not because I can't move my legs. Carl Malone, who is six foot nine, weighs about 300 pounds, grabs my belt and he's holding my belt. <laughs> As I have to go up now, I hear him and Pippin in the background now laughing as hard as they can while I'm standing there. I look over my shoulder, he releases me, and I tear down to go up to get my jacket. So that was my first moment. The camaraderie that I faced there with the people I was warmly received. And for those that follow basketball, my last morning turned out to be an amazing morning. I went there and had breakfast. And my wife and I were now leaving there to go to one more Hall of Fame event. But as we sat down for breakfast, I had the car packed. And now in comes Jerry West. Now, for those of you who don't know who basketball is, if you've ever seen the NBA logo, the NBA logo is Jerry West. So from this point on, I won't refer to him as Jerry West. He's the logo. So the logo comes in with the sun, walks around, and I'm kind of like eyeing where he's going. And uh, I'm finishing, and he walks around, comes over and says something to me, and then walks back over and grabs some stuff from the buffet, and then comes in and sits right next to me. Okay, so I have the logo right here. Now, the logo is one of the greatest scorers in the history of the NBA. I watched him play uh, in playoff games when he was a, uh, at his peak, and he was playing with the Lakers, and I was a big Boston Celtic fan. So I watched these championships, and he would average 40 points for the playoff series, and almost single-handedly keep them in every game. Just an unbelievable offensive player. He sits down. My wife is checking out, doing things, making sure the grandkids are on the way home. And he sits down, and he sits down, and he goes, Coach, I want to talk about shooting with you. And now, any of you have a passion for anything, I am now fired up beyond belief. The logo wants to talk about shooting, okay? In the door comes Mrs. Hurley, and she taps me on the shoulder. Mrs. Hurley here, the logo here. The logo wants to talk about shooting. Mrs. Hurley gives me one of those, we need to get going. So now I'm married, now I'm married 42 years. I was 40 at the time. So I'm bending my knees, and I'm trying to figure out, what do I do here? Now, here's great advice for relationships. You always want to have points on account. You always want to be ahead of the game. You never know when you need those points. If you operate as a younger person, and you're always at a deficit, it's a problem. But if you can accumulate some good points, someone might say brownie points, that's probably true. But I had accumulated a lot of points. All right, so Mrs. Hurley, look now, I turned to her and I went like this, like, oh, God, I can't do this. And I said to her, I will get a, t a speeding ticket. We'll get to where we have to go. I must listen to this man speak. So for the rest of the breakfast, which couldn't have been more than half an hour, he talks to me about shooting. 
I'm now going to conclude the day, I get, I get us on time, I'm off the hook, and the next day I begin basketball camp in the Pocono Mountains. The highs and lows of life are, I'm sitting with Jerry West, I've had Carl Malone and Scotty Pippen think so much of me, they're pranking me, and now I go up to the Pocono Mountains and I have 320 kids from age 8 to 16 who are basketball camp. And as soon as I get there, the guy who runs the camp for me says, Coach, we want you to do something today. What's the first thing you want to do? And what we do is we break it up into maybe four or five groups of anywhere from 60 to 75 kids. And I said to them, I'm doing shooting today. <laughs> and what I did with each group is I sat them down and I said, all right, who knows who the logo is? Everybody had their hands up. I said, well, I had breakfast with the logo yesterday and this is what the logo says about shooting. You talk about having a captive audience. <laughs> Camp started, I had them for the whole first day. Now, that got me back to where I was at that point. Uh, some advice, okay, some advice. And what I suggest you do in life, okay, white hair, gray, and this is from the male side of things, white hair, gray hair, no hair. Listen to people, okay, because life's experiences are, are, are they're hard to duplicate, okay? And we have a tendency sometimes to listen to people our age because of that, that term peer pressure. I don't, I, I don't totally understand that because I know when I think back to myself at 17, no one should listen to me. When I was 15, <laughs> less people should listen to me, okay? And, and, and down the ladder. So that you are at a point now where you're, you're, uh, you know, you're growing up, you know, be your own person, don't be, don't, don't have problems with getting, uh, asking teachers questions, uh, you know, uh, going up and asking a coach a question, you know. Nobody on my team is going to be in the locker room saying to somebody, uh, what are you doing talking to a coach after practice? I'm so demanding. If somebody is like strong enough minded to come and ask me a question, the other kids are like in awe that they would actually come and ask a question because we do so much in such a short period of time of practice. But, uh, you know, you want to associate with people that are setting goals. You yourself want to set goals. You know, I tell you about, you know, look back where you're growing up, things you did, where you are now, where would you like to go to? When I was standing on a street corner in Jersey City at 17, okay, and my neighborhood was not a rough neighborhood compared to other neighborhoods in the city, pretty rough, pretty rough. And I was standing on a corner, no way, shape, or form did I ever think that I would be traveling around the United States, getting up and speaking in front of groups when I had that five minute speech that you had in class and I suffered with that like I was, like uh, this most difficult thing that I was ever gonna have to do. And somewhere along the line, as I got older, I realized that my life experiences actually give me the opportunity to share a little bit. And what happens when you share, a percentage of the audience doesn't listen, you try to reach a percentage of the audience that you are talking to. My days in probation, I was only getting one out of five. Only one person was listening. When I go to my St. Anthony's practice, it's different than being here. When I talk and I have 15 kids minimum on my team, no one takes their eyes off me until I'm done talking. I have such command of my kids at home because of respect. Okay? I respect them, I care about them, I want them to do well. I believe that teachers and parents allow a lot of you to be kind of ordinary or average, and you could be much more, you could do much more, and you don't allow that to happen. When the kids come to me to play basketball, they are committing themselves to something that is going to be different than anything they've ever done before. Because I think with the human spirit and the potential people have, there's a door that we can open, and as I said, not just open it, rip it off, and do something about it. So, when Mr. North talked about the amount of kids that I've had play college, I don't know what the whole town of Houston, I don't know how many kids from Houston will be playing Division I basketball this coming year. I know how many out of the other schools in Jersey City are playing Division I basketball, but I'll have 20 kids this year who played for me who are in college who are playing Division I basketball right now and I'll have well over 30 kids that are playing basketball at the college level. And already this year, two of my kids have accepted scholarships. 
I think I'll have as many as five seniors accept scholarships right now. So what we do is we give opportunities. We tell people that you can commit to high school and you can be just one of the kids. If you listen, you work hard, you set goals, you'd be very surprised you know, where this can take it. So uh, you want to shoot for the stars. I tell you a story, right? It's true. I always say when we do things, we have a meeting. The kids right in front of the meeting, sitting down on the floor and talking to the kids, they retain more information than those that are on the periphery. When you're in class and you have a chance to sit in front of a class, okay, you're always going to get more information than those that sit in the back. When I run my study halls at St. Anthony's, and I do it four days a week for my basketball team, when we open up the classroom, if kids go into the back of the classroom right away, I say to them, wow, we must not have a good relationship because I'm volunteering my time to run a study hall after school so we can get some homework done before practice. And yet I come in and you people go to the back of the room. I also run a JV study hall at the same time. The JV kids want to get on the varsity. Where do you think the JV kids are sitting? Where are they? They're all fighting for that one seat in front of me. There's nobody in the back of the room. I'll bring the JV kids in from the one study hall into the varsity study hall and say, guys, What's wrong with this? And one of my sophomores will say, Coach, they're all in the back. They've made the varsity. They're not setting goals anymore to learn as much as they can from you. And then we learn that lesson and we move on. My son Bobby, okay, uh, Mr. North mentioned, he was a, uh, he was a uh, very accomplished basketball player. When he was in grammar school, he played for Alania Mercy School in Jersey City. As an eighth grader, he was five foot one and he weighed 90 pounds. When they did the, uh, you know, when you would walk for graduation, we had to have, be ready to take pictures right away because he's going to be in front of the group. He was going to be one of the first people coming up. So uh, when he was in the uh, eighth grade, he'd gone to basketball camps forever. He had grown up in the gym. He's a June, he was born in June. When he was 18 months old, I started bringing him to practice. My wife had just had our second child. She was home taking care of the baby, and I would bring this 18 year old. 18-month-old, uh, and we bring some uh, uh, toys, a blanket, uh, forgot diapers, never remembered to bring diapers, but we <laughs> brought the other things, had a manager watch him, and he grew up in the gym from age 18 months on. He was exposed to great players. While he grew up and he played, I had three or four uh, outstanding players. One young man, David Rivers, who went to Notre Dame, was a four-time uh, most valuable player, played in the NBA. So when Bobby was growing up, these were the guys he was around all the time. And he wanted to be like that. When he hit the eighth grade, it was a career day. And a man came to his school and was asking kids, what are they going to do? And one kid put his hand up and said, I want to I be a lawyer. I want to be a doctor. A uh, young lady said, I want to be a singer. And he sat here in front, just like I said, first seat. And finally, he had his hand up the whole time. He wanted to tell this guy what he was going to do. And when it finally happened, he could get up. He stood up. And he said, well, here's what I want to do. I want to go to St. Anthony High School. I want to break David Rivers' records. All right, David, was, David played on two straight state championships, his junior and senior year. All right, I want to go there. I want to get myself a scholarship to college, basketball scholarship to college, okay? I want to, I want to play in the NBA for the Boston Celtics. All right, these are the three things he wanted to do. The man who was there, who ran this particular event, saw a five foot one, 90 pound kid, and you know what he did? The man like smiles, like, oh, that's cute. Good luck with that, one of those looks, right? And now, in the audience behind him, he heard a lot of laughing because of the man's reaction to it. So I don't know if you're this tough, but he was. He turned right around to confront the entire group, and he wanted to see who was laughing. So five foot one, 90 pounds of fury turns around, <laughs> and he looks at the audience, and those who did laugh, he said to me, I look through everybody, and guys had their heads down. He said, I looked to see if my friends had their heads down. Some did, some didn't. So I said to him, what'd you do? What'd you do about it? We were talking about this later on that day at dinner. And he said, well, I ran home, got my ball, went to the courts. Nobody down there, took the ball, used my imagination for about an hour and a half, went up and down the court, played, and shot the ball, thought about this guy being in front of me on defense, buying, laying in, did all those things. So I said, and what did you think about the kids in the class? They said, they have no idea. They're my age. What do they know about what I'm going to do? So, and this is the way you have to be to be successful. You have to believe in yourself because you're going to have obstacles. 
and you have to fight through obstacles because of self-belief and commitment. So when he got to high school, he played in four straight state championships to Dave Rivers too. David was a McDonald's All-American. First one that I had played in the McDonald's All-American game. Bobby played in the McDonald's All-American game and was the co-MVP with Shaquille O'Neal, okay? Got a scholarship to Duke University. When he went to Duke University, Dave Rivers got to the NCAA tournament four times. Bobby Hurley got to the championship game three times, all right? Was a champion twice, was the MVP of the whole NCAA tournament once. Dave Rivers was the last pick in the first round. Bobby was the seventh pick in the draft. You know what happens in my school now? Everybody tries to chase what Bobby did because he did more things than anyone else. But what he did was, and I advise you all to try this, if there's something you're passionate about and you want to be good at, he wrote on a piece of paper all of those things he wanted to do. He hung them up on the wall in his bedroom. When he get up in the morning, lie on the bedroom, he'd see it. At the end of the day, before he went to sleep, before he put the light out, see it as he laid down. You look at the piece of paper, did you do something that day to try to reach your dream, or did you do, or not? And then that, after a while, the piece of paper becomes irrelevant if it's not motivating you all the time. So that's a terrific thing for, for what you can do. Uh, my school, I had the same dreams and goals. When I started coaching in 1968, I was the freshman coach. And then in 1970, I became the JV coach. And in 1973, I became a varsity coach. When I was a sophomore in high school, I had a chance to play against the Napa High School from Washington, D.C. in a big tournament in Newport, Rhode Island. As a sophomore, I had a chance to play against a team, one of the best teams in the country, coached by Morgan Wooten. Okay, coached by Morgan Wooten. I became a high school coach, and now I wanted to try to make my high school team like to Matha High School from Washington, D.C. They were, every senior for decades got a scholarship to college. I looked at the kids I'm gonna have at St. Anthony's, and I didn't think that every kid is gonna get a scholarship to college. But I didn't see why every kid couldn't go to college. So he made a goal, Coach Wooden, every senior is gonna get a scholarship. My goal became, I thought more realistic, every kid is gonna to go to college. So today, after 40 years, I've missed twice. I've only had two kids not go to college in four years of coaching. Right, so that one thing which we set as a goal, okay, we've done. We kind of patterned what we did after this coach from Damatha. Two years ago, we had a chance to play against Damatha. They were number 16 in the country. Okay, we were a really good team trying to get pieces together. A Catholic school in our area closed. Two very good players transferred into our school. We were going through a period of time where we were trying to put pieces together that hadn't previously been put together, fit these pieces. At the same time, the Miami Heat had just put together a group of people, uh, Chris Bosch, LeBron James had just joined, uh, Dwayne Wade, and they were trying to do the same thing. During the Christmas holidays, my team went to a tournament, and when we got to the tournament, we were still so disjointed that one of my players brought all his video games with us, with him, and he left his home uniform. Okay, but had all his video games. We open up the tournament, the first game, he doesn't have a uniform. We bring a blood uniform in case there's going to, somebody was to, to bleed. It's too small a uniform to wear. And the assistant coaches say to me, Coach, let's take a uniform off one of our last guys on the bench and have him uh, switch uniforms. Now, if you gather just by being around me a bit, do you think that was something I was going to do? So he was going to sit out. As he sits out, St. Patrick's Elizabeth is playing on television and they're playing against the, the coach from uh, Boston Celtics, Doc Rivers. They're playing against Doc Rivers' son, Austin, on television. And they win this tournament in Florida. We're up in Boston. We can't even get our players to remember to bring the uniforms. So we think about the two groups. This team we're gonna have to play at the end of the year in the state tournament. They're the number one team in the country. We're in there someplace on potential, not performance. So I watched a, a post game during Christmas and Dwayne Wayne comes on and somebody says to him, with these pieces that you have, what do you think about your team right now? And Dwayne Wade said something spectacular. He said, we are not a championship team right now. We're trying to develop championship habits. And maybe the longer we're together trying to develop those habits, we're going to be able to function and be good. So that became our mantra. So now here it is now, Christmas, we can't even get everybody there on time. Mid-January, we played the Matha High School. 
We've played them once or twice over my 40 years. This game is going to be on Martin Luther King Day on national television at the Basketball Hall of Fame. I've just been inducted this previous August. So we have all kinds of things going on. Imagine my awkwardness when I'm taking my team on a tour of the Basketball Hall of Fame and we come up to the picture of me on the wall where I have to like exit stage left and leave it there and wait for them to come back downstairs because they're trying to like stand there while that's going on. Well, preparation meets opportunity. We had four chances to scout them before we played them. We saw them four times. They, I believe, only used the video of a previous game, the previous year, when we played as a basis for getting ready for us. On national television, when we scout them, we f find that they don't start games very well. They're very sluggish in the beginning of games. In all the games we scouted, the opponent got a big lead. Talent-wise, they came back and they won the game. So we think we have a chance to get a lead early. And then in a, in a term that I use all the time, keep our foot on their neck, okay? Keep our foot on their neck, which means keep the pressure on them the whole time. So the game starts 18 to four to start the game with up. We're up 20 at halftime. We talk to the we talk to the kids about they have a run coming. There's a run coming. We have to just keep playing and control it. And at the end of the third quarter, we were up by a significant amount of points. My best player at the time was a junior. He had scored 28 points with three minutes left in the third quarter. I took him out of the game with 11 minutes left in the game. Now that's significant because he had 28. The game ended. We beat the math of 75 to 25. On national television, we beat them by 50 points, and one of my players outscored their whole team. So what did we find we have now? In one month, we have made enormous improvement. So the bar has to be completely set now in a different level. So now, St. Pat's Elizabeth is going to be the litmus test for us now, and we're going to play them. And we're going to play them on March 9th in the state tournament, as it turns out, in the biggest game in the history of New Jersey basketball at Rutgers University before about 9,000 people. A month in advance, Steve Croft from 60 Minutes calls up and he says, I want to follow your team. So now we have 60 Minutes follows for a month. The other team, uh, St. Patrick's Elizabeth, has a documentary being made about them. They have a player on the team, Michael Kidd Gilchrist, who was the second player picked in the draft this year and a talented player in every position. So you have a documentary by HBO you have 60 minutes following us. You have TV crews and media people from all over the United States. The biggest high school game in the United States in a few years. The biggest game ever in New Jersey. And we're prepared. We work at it. We see the opponent 10 times. Not two times or three or four times. We see them 10 times. When we play them now, we pretty much are prepared that we're going to do our best if we just relaxed and let it happen. It's like getting ready for the SAT, and you're extremely worried about that Saturday morning, you're gonna take the SAT. The night before, you should have a good meal, get to sleep early, maybe listen to some music, and blank it out. Because by the time you hit the day before something like that, worry should not be a factor anymore. If you had the preparation, you're gonna reach your opportunity. So the game starts, at the end of the first quarter, we're down six points. Uh, at halftime, we're down, uh, down five points. So what spin could I put on that? We've lost, uh, you know, we're down five at halftime. The spin we put is, we played much better in the second quarter. We uh, outscored them by one in the second quarter. And I asked a bunch of these kids, how do they feel about this game? Every single kid said to me, they've never been more nervous in their whole life than that period of time they're playing right now. This game was the biggest game they ever played in. So I, I calmed everybody down, told them how we were getting into the game, things were gonna go better for us. And a couple of things we were going to do in the second half. Once we got a lead, we were going to do something defensively. Our conditioning and preparation were going to pay off. And it was going to become a plus. Well, it turned out we got down five in the third quarter. And with about two minutes left, we're down five. We called a timeout right in front of our bench. And we run a play that we only run state tournament special situations. And it's a play that is a very clever play and it will result in us getting a layup. So we run the play, come out of the timeout, we run the play, and 9,000 people go, 
ooh, when they lay the ball in off the play, like a, a screen, a back door, a pass, lay it in there, they ooh. So the quarter ends now, okay? And we go down one at the end of the third quarter. So it was one point we outscored them in the second quarter, four points in the third quarter, and now momentum shifts our way. We say to the kids, we're gonna play a zone in the fourth quarter if we get a lead. I had traveled to Fresno, California to learn about this zone. Okay, I'm a veteran coach, but we're not still doing the same things that we did you know, years before. We get the defense in, I say to the kids, if we get a five, we're gonna to switch to the zone, we're gonna confuse them, they haven't seen it, and we're gonna have a run. Sure enough, like I actually know what I'm talking about, we go up five, and we go up five, we switch to the zone. The number one team in the country, we beat by 17 points, because everything that we did to prepare, every day that we got better, they were great. If you look at Michael Kidd Gilchrist, he was the second player selected in the draft, the NBA draft this year. He was an All-American Kentucky last year national championship. He scored seven points against us and didn't score a point in the second half of the game because the kid that was playing against him was a man possessed. Those moments are why you work. As you get older now and you, you're gonna find your passion, I hope that you're fortunate enough that your passion is what you're good at. I found that by just being dedicated to my craft and, and having the opportunity to be a probation officer, I could look inside <coughs> the lives of kids and help to steer them a little bit. Now, my last thing for you is the, the word pride, right? P-R-I-D-E. Preparation every day. P, you prepare. You're passionate about what you do, right? If you're not passionate, it's gonna be hard to be great at something, okay? Even with a lot of natural ability, the R for pride, repetition, okay? If there's something you need to become good at, you repeat the good habit every day. In basketball, if somebody's going free throw shoot, they shoot free throws every day. They shoot them exactly the same, right? I, imitate the best in the world. If somebody is really good at what they do, imitation is the highest form, okay, of flattery, okay? Imitate. Have intensity when you, when you work. You want to be good at something? Work at, at game speed. Work as hard as you can on that. D, be determined. Okay, be determined to be good. Don't let obstacles get in your path. And the last thing is that in everything you're gonna do in life, when it comes time to execute, when you have to execute something, you have to relax at the point of execution. It's the kid in baseball that gets his pitch at two and up, and he's trying too hard to do something with it, and he just fouls off the good pitch. Someone else who's up there is relaxed, he just lets it happen. He doesn't make it happen. All right, so your enthusiasm and your execution in important times are very important. Uh, I want to wish you all the best of luck. Okay, I, I, you, have, you have privileged opportunities where you're growing up right now. Okay, you have wonderful opportunities. You need to take advantage of these advantages that you have. And as you're growing up right now, make sure that in your way, as you're growing and going through college and going into your adult life, that there's some give back in your life. That you do something where you can give back to someone, and you do that, there'll be a feeling that will be an extraordinary feeling. So enjoy everything, enjoy your year in school. Best of luck, we have a football game uh, tomorrow night. Football team tomorrow night's playing. We have a, we have a game, a uh, fall league game coming up, but we've got all kinds of things going on. Uh, college coaches are in my gym, and uh, you know, for my 41st year, I'm as excited about what I'm doing as when I first started. So, uh, thanks so much for having me. Again, I want to thank the, uh, the Hinchia family for having me here and uh, acknowledge again my peer, Coach Mack here, who is uh, uh, his impact. I hope I've had the same impact in my school as he has had in his. And uh, I want to thank you all for your attention today. Best of luck. Sustained applause, reflection, both of your career and the quality of your comments this morning. And thank you so much for being here. Betty, thank you very much. And to John and your family for 
sponsoring this wonderful program, Coach Mack. Thank you for being here uh, in, in uh, Georgia Piazza in our advanced for office time. Lord, thank you very much for everything you've done. Have a great day, everyone.